Hello, everyone, and welcome to the main event, Mark's podcast, WrestleMania edition, now on the Unhinged Sports Network. I am lifelong wrestling fan, former radio guy, and cat dad, Troy, and with me as always is the WWE Walking Wrestling Encyclopedia and the main event collector. He is the Bull Buchanan to my good father. No, oh, shut Greg. up. <laughs> he is Greg. What's up, Greg? B squared. Hey, he had a, a no, run. No, don't, don't defend it. He sucked. He had multiple runs, man. He sucked. Yeah. Look at back his work. Oh, my God. I'm like, why did this guy get employed? He was terrible. I didn't think his wrestling was, like, oh, super he was, bad. But. He was the drizzling shits. We can edit that. <laughs> I watched yeah. this back, and I'm like, oh, my God. This is the only dud on the whole card. Not to get ahead. <laughs> he wow. sucks. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, uh, it was what it was. Though. Well, I mean, oh. I love the Godfather. but Yeah, I I will tell you what. I mean, it's weird with the time frame here. We're talking about WrestleMania 21. Uh, I was not even I, – I was 10 years old, uh, but I was a big fan of the Godfather. And, oh, uh, I, I love that. <laughs> yeah. I just I I thought he was uh you know a good wrestler I thought I mean he was entertaining so I I was like ah cool whatever uh, you know good father or Godfather excuse me but like when he when he switched to the good father I was just like I was so pissed and I know that was like the whole point you were supposed to get people pissed off and riled up and whatever I just eh, I don't know mommy what's the whole train what the hell. Uh, I mean, my dad kind of gave me the highlights of, like, what all that stuff meant, you know, without getting into, like, gritty detail. <laughs> I mean, when I'm 10, I'm not thinking about that kind of stuff yet, so. But uh, I do want to let everybody know that we are here on the podcast sponsored by Fubo TV and Fanatics. On Fubo, you get live sports and TV without cable. I cut the cord. You can, too. You can get over 100-plus channels live and on demand and a cloud DVR. And there are no hidden fees. You can cancel any time. You can sign up for your free uh, trial membership right now if you click on the link down in the podcast description. As far as Fanatics, you know, it's March Madness. There are a lot of sports going on right now. And we personally recommend the Ultimate Sports Apparel and Fan Gear site of Fanatics. And also, they've got weekly fan cash deals where... It's just various deals on various items, whether it's money off of shipping, uh, you know, discounts on the clothes itself. I mean, whatever. So go check them out. Again, and hurry up fanatics. because baseball's coming back, so everything's going to jack up. Yeah, that's true. So click on the link down in the description for Fanatics. And we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to dive into all the news and notes from WrestleMania 17. And this, I mean, you and I have argued over what the best – WrestleMania in history is. I think, don't you say it's 19? Yep. Okay. That's, I mean, that's it in, is, but, you know. That's that's in my top three. <laughs> WrestleMania 17 is still my, my top. I can't not go with that one. So, but all right. Well, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back on the other side here, uh, it is the news and notes from around this time of WrestleMania X7. Follow the Main Event Marks at Facebook.com forward slash Main Event Marks Pod, on Twitter at Main Event underscore Marks, and on Instagram at Main Event underscore Marks, and at Main Event Collector. It's the very best of professional wrestling's past every Monday on Retro Wrestling Review. I'm your host, Troy, and together we'll hop on my time-traveling wrestling ring and watch along to the greatest matches from yesteryear in the sport of kings. As complex, as controversial, 
and as brilliant, really, as he is. On Triple R, we'll cover matches from across the world, including American territories, Canada, Mexico, and Japan. Fast action, lots more than that. You'll learn some things, find out about wrestlers and matches you never even knew about, and we'll have some laughs. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Retro Wrestling Pod. Retro Wrestling Review is available wherever you get podcasts, including YouTube, served up fresh every Monday morning. Unbelievable! The crowd absolutely stunned! The main event marks are available wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. Now back to the show. All right, we are back, and I uh, just want to let you know before we dive into the news and notes that if you are not listening to us on the Unhinged Sports Network and you're listening to the podcast, like on uh, a podcast provider, first of all, thank you. Or if you're listening to us on YouTube, we appreciate it. Subscribe and leave a comment and all that good stuff. Hit that and little bell. Yeah, hit the little bell. Apparently that's notifications. the thing you got to yep. say. <laughs> yeah, hit the little bell because uh, I'm, they're not good about you know letting you know just because you subscribe. I mean, I know for a fact. I've subscribed to a lot of things, and I'm like, oh, they have a new video, and I, I didn't even know. It posted like a week ago. I use my Xbox app, and there's always a green dot next to people who have new videos, so that's how I know. Yeah. It's good enough for yeah. me. Yeah, if you, but if you don't pull up the app all the time, you're, it's not going to notify you, obviously. So that's what the bell is for. And uh, past that, if you are not listening to us on the Unhinged Sports Network, we are live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern. Check us out, unhingedsn.airtime.pro. And if you are listening to us on the Unhinged Sports Network and you missed the beginning of the show, you want to hear the whole thing again, we play again Thursday at 6 p.m. That Thursday! Is our, that is our first replay, so go check that out. All right. So, Thursday is the only night of the week without any wrestling on TV. Yeah, so you don't have to have us on in the background. You can just listen to us. Well, there is NXT UK, though, which is on the network, so there is wrestling every day of the week. So just... mm, yeah, that's true. I know, so... Uh, oh, that's right. I, I always forget Impact is on Tuesdays. I, I just don't oh, watch, so I forget. <laughs> but all right. You know what the big story is. I think everybody knows what the big story is. I mean, it's... Yeah, it's Trish Stratus obvious. barking like a dog. <laughs> Good Lord. Uh, we talked about that in last week's episode on Greed, by the way. So I'm actually glad, for those of you that were expecting ECW last week, we moved that to next week. Oh, yeah, and more of that at the end of the show. But I'm kind of glad we covered Greed and then this, because it, it is going in chronological order here with the shows. So, you know, we're not having to backtrack with the news. <laughs> so, diving into this, the WWF's purchase of WCW this week and the end of wrestling on Turner Networks will no doubt change the entire landscape of the professional wrestling industry forever. The final episode of Nitro began this week with the surreal image of Vince McMahon addressing the audience, the final scene of Nitro was a music video promoting the Rock Austin match at WrestleMania, possibly the greatest WWF produced music video of all time. I mean, can you think of another one that that would rank up there? Not the sidetrack, but <laughs> off the top of my head. No, yeah. I I mean the only one and it wasn't for a match, it was more of like a person, but it personally got me hyped. I think it was one of the best things about WrestleMania twenty seven was the Miz Hate Me Now video. I thought that was pretty damn sweet. But anyway, uh, in between, a huge angle simulcast on both Raw and Nitro featured Shane McMahon, quote, buying WCW out from under his father. They made it clear that WCW will still be kept alive as a babyface company under Shane to feud with Vince. Nitro's final match saw yeah, Flair... Work out. <laughs> yeah, more on that. <laughs> uh, Nitro's final match saw Flair and Sting, WCW's two most enduring stars doing one last shortened version of the match that they've done a million times, and it ended with Sting beating Flair because, even to the bitter end, they never realized that Ric Flair was always the face of WCW, not Sting. These are not my words. These are Uncle Dave Meltzer's words. Well, uh, I mean, once once a guy leaves, even if he came back, he forfeits that face of whatever. Sorry. Yeah, I... <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm th- I don't know. Like... I get it. Flair was kind of was the guy multiple times as far as like popularity and whatever. But it's like, for God's sake, like, Sting was the most loyal guy in the history of WCW. He was literally WCW made, born and bred, you know, in his career. So I, I don't know. 
why would Flair beat Sting? I realized he was the one that was going to WWE eventually, but like at that point, admittedly, he was out of shape. He literally wore a shirt during the match because he was embarrassed. He hadn't wrestled in, I mean, actually had a match in a while, right? Uh, he might. He had that that match we just talked about. That was about it. Yeah, and and he wrestled. And keep in mind, he wrestled his shirt in that too. So. Yeah, go back and listen. He's he's wrestling like he's about to leave the ring and head right to the uh, the hotel at the beach. So I mean, they were in Jacksonville, so he probably just wore that all day. He's probably gonna go watch his favorite team, the Jags. Yeah, yeah, it's just yeah. I think he roots for another cat themed football team, but I could be wrong. Uh, Uncle Dave talks about. This being the biggest news this week in the history of the business, and not to mention WrestleMania 17 is coming up this week also, which is going to be one of the biggest money shows in history. While the sale of WCW is the big story, there are countless smaller stories stemming from this. Uh, what becomes of the WCW stars? Several of them are collecting huge paychecks, and WWF isn't going to want to take those or take over those contracts, which means... Several of WCW's biggest names are likely to sit out for a long time and continue collecting on contracts that yeah, Turner do. still has to honor. Yep. That's why we didn't see the NWO until uh, next year? Yeah, uh, February, no out. Next, February next yeah. year. Yep. Yeah. Uh, what becomes of the wrestling boom? It exploded a few years ago to uh, due to the ratings wars, but ever since, it became so lopsided in WWS favor the business has clearly been declining. A worked version of the WWF versus WCW war will probably do big business for a while, but when that's over, then what? Uh, yeah, I what mean, an optimist, huh? Let's just keep looking past everything. Ish. Just like, well, a lot of people just focus on what's right in front of them. Don't worry about later. Later's gonna come. Don't worry. Just worry about right now. I mean, in I his never defense, understood people's. No, don't defend him. Well, well, no, it, well, I know you don't like Meltzer or whatever. I get it. But no, in, I, I hate if, him. I just, if, there's only a few people I hate. He's a piece of shit, but... If you're going to call yourself a reporter, which he does for whatever effing reason, your your whole job is kind of to look at not only what's happening now, but what's yet to come because of this, and, you know, report and pontificate and whatever, so... I get it, but... After this, wouldn't they sell out the, the Sky Dome for WrestleMania? Uh, X8, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, that, just... I mean, yeah, so they did, they did do <laughs> a couple of years of big business... I mean, obviously, things kind of dipped after a while. I mean, all across the board. I'm not just saying in WWE. I'm just saying, like, across everything. And, I mean, a lot of people do point to, it's like, yeah, it was going hot and heavy when you had two major companies battling it out on top. So, I mean, What it's about kinda... the way in? Was that really hot and heavy? Weren't they just... Didn't they well, say I... suck at the end? Yeah, that one was like, well, they're still here, but WWF's, you know, whooping ass. So they did. They, they were did there in name value. Things. Right. Yeah. Uh, but the the Monday Night Wars ended in 1999. Don't fool yourself. It, I mean, it well, it very much did. Yeah. yeah. I I will say, you know, everybody can point to, well, you know, this angle led to it, or this particular show led to it, and it's easy to do that. And we as fans, sure, whatever. But the more you learn about it, I will say the Monday Night Wars ended as soon as Turner merged with Time Warner. Yep, got all the rich white guys in suits, think they know everything. <laughs> wow. Yeah, just, that's that's exactly when it is. A lot of people, I mean, Eric Bischoff talked about a lot of people in Turner for a long time did not, the only person in Turner that he could name that actually wanted to keep WCW alive was Ted Turner himself. Everybody else hated it. Didn't he want loved to his wrestling. It. Yeah. They, the people in... Uh, CNN Tower there were like, well, we do news and real sports. That is beneath us in WCW. And, and, and movies, don't forget. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we buy up old black and white films and re-air them on our TV stations. <laughs> I guess not just films. They also aired Andy Griffith, you know, so there's that. Which is in black and white. Yeah, so it's keeping with the theme. Uh, but, the you know, then Time Warner came in, and I guess everybody at Time Warner, like, front, back, Top, bottom, whatever. They all hated wrestling, and they wanted nothing to do with WCW, and they were looking for a reason to cancel it. And they got a good reason, and they canceled it. So Yeah, his name was Vince Russo. I mean, yeah. Like I said, it's easy to point to that, but I, I feel like if they would have kept it alive, 
I mean, ebb and flow and changing of guards or whatever, I feel like WCW could have had a comeback. Not to the heights of it, of where it was particularly, you know, per se, but, uh, you know, I, I think they could have made a okay. comeback and been, like, respectable and made money. But here's the thing. They were failing because WWE was kicking their ass, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, to... Okay, to that was never going to stop. No, but, well, that that was that was an extent, but at the same time, I mean, you can make the argument of, uh, you know, people are going to hate me, but if you're going to... They're on different nights, but if we're going to compare numbers, WWE is kicking AEW's ass, but AEW makes money, and they sell tickets. I feel like WCW could have done that. They didn't. It didn't have to be a war, per se. And yeah, even if they were, yeah, it's not a war now either. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. Well, if they could have, if they could have, uh, seceded the point and just gave up, or, you know, quote unquote, gave up, move Nitro to Tuesday nights. It would have taken some getting used to. It would have taken a lot of programming people's minds. Hey, we're on Tuesday, and Thunder's on Wednesday or whatever. You know, do back to back shows. But they they could have done it. I feel like. They probably should have got rid of Thunder because nobody watched that period. Right. And you were saying there towards the end, and they were kind of like starting to try to make Thunder matter. Yeah, they did. I mean, that's not that this matters, but that was when people forget. That's when that's where David Arquette won the world title. Like, no one seems to remember that. That didn't happen on Nitro. (laughs) I I did like this isn't part of the news story, but it's kind of quantification here. Uh, Uncle Dave said, uh, Vince has absolutely nothing to prove by showing the fans that he, who was better because he now owns both companies. So it's imperative not to bury WCW if this is going to have any chance of working. And the guy who wrote the article put LOL. <laughs> <laughs> Don't uh, bury it more. Yeah. I, the guys they got, they got a handful of, of decent talents. Like, I mean, I don't think you much cared for him, but they got Canyon who, I mean, he, Whatever, he was around for a long time, and he was a good hand in the ring. They got Lance Storm. Uh, they got Chronic. Morris. Oh. Yeah. Chronic Morris. didn't come until way later, actually. Like, way later. In really? September. Yeah, September. Uh, so they were only around for, like, a couple of months? They were around for one month. Oh, okay. Well, either way, I mean, they got they got mostly the young guys who it's like they were I trying think he, to think the centerpiece of the whole thing was Booker T. Yeah, so yeah, Booker, DDP. How could I forget about DDP? Uh, I mean, Booker was the only one they made feel like a top guy, though. I mean, you can argue that DDP feuded with the Undertaker, but that feud kind of sucked. Uh, the TV situation is particularly interesting, as mentioned. The business is clearly in a downturn. I, I guess I, I don't know about that. So many seventeen but, break records and buy rates and stuff. Yeah, and and uh, yeah, WrestleMania oh, eight. What a fun. Yeah, and and the invasion pay per view, as much as I didn't really care for it, like broke all kinds of records. So, but anyway, uh, last year WCW was on the market to be sold for six hundred million dollars, and there was never even a consideration that they would lose their TV deal. At the same time, WWF was securing a huge TV deal with Viacom. There were more TV networks that wanted wrestling than there was wrestling. But a lot of change, but a lot changed that year. Turner canceled WCW and Fusion Media couldn't find another network to carry it. ECW was kicked off of TNN and they couldn't find another network either. The bloom is off the rose and TV networks are no longer as interested in wrestling as they were a year ago. Not FX only, was one of them, right? Uh, from what I heard, FX was the one that Fusion was talking with for, for Nitro. But I guess it, Eric Bischoff said that, that killed the deal because he said, uh, they, you know, all was, was a go. And he said he was on vacation thinking, well, they're hammering out the details. I'm going to come back and get a phone call. Hey, here's what we agreed upon. And he said, instead he gets a uh, phone call on vacation. They're like, yeah, the deal's done. We're, 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 uh, we're pulling out. And he's like, why? He said, they canceled TV. We're done. We don't, we don't want it anymore. Cause the whole point was they wanted nitro on a nationwide station like Turner. And once that went kaput, they were like, yeah, uh, no more. So I don't know. It, it was kind of like if uh, did you ever hear the stories about when Ted Turner bought uh, Jim Cro- Jim Crockett Promotions? His major things. He's like, I want Ric Flair. If Ric Flair's not a part of the deal, I don't want it. Uh, yeah. I'm, uh... Yeah. So if, and I guess Rick 
I, this was like the story of his career, but I guess Rick was thinking about going to WWE at that time, and he decided against it because he's like, well, if it'll help with the sale, I'll stick around. I mean, kind of screwed him over in the end, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, so I think this was the whole thing. Like, if, if they would have kept Nitro on Turner, at least for a little while until they could get a new TV deal, I think Fusion would have Fusion and Eric Bischoff would have bought it. Uh, not only is that why ECW and now WCW are dead, but that means that it's going to be uh, that much harder for any company to come along and fill that void on a national level. Bottom line, one man now has a monopoly on American professional wrestling, and that's bad for the wrestling business as a whole. Uh, opinion. I just, it, uh, I don't think it's a monopoly when there's nothing else and the, the uh, competition's going out of business. It's not like they yeah. were rolling hot and he bought it. It's, that's how that's the definition of monopoly when you buy everything. It was dead. He bought the rights. Yeah. I mean, calling him up it makes no sense. And I it, I can see why they were trying to argue it, but at the same time, it's yeah. I mean, there were other wrestling companies out there. Were they nationwide and on TV and whatever? No, but I, I mean, I don't know. That's like if, if you have. Uh, the only pizza shop in town and the other pizza shops are con- like there's two other pizza shops and they're competing with you and then they start to go out of business. They're, they're going bankrupt and you buy them and shut them down and you replace them with your pizza, like more of your pizza shop. Is that a monopoly? Not right. if they're going down. No. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I, I don't I don't buy that. Uh, WWF has purchased the name and trademarks owned by WCW, the videotape library, and the contracts of 24 of the lower-paid wrestlers. Time Warner is still on the hook to fulfill the remaining contracts, as well as dealing with any of WCW's outstanding lawsuits and bills. <laughs> Vince and Linda... <laughs> that's Senior. a lot. <laughs> right. Yeah, Vince is like, who is this little Japanese guy that's trying to sue me? I'm not racist. Damn it, put the Mexicans on John Deere tractors. What the hell? I know that was way later, but you know. I think that was his idea. Apparently, it was Hoovy Toots. Oh, for God's sake! Do we have that's to blame Hoovy for that too? That's what Bruce said. Oh gosh! So we have something else to blame that idiot for. <laughs> he said it'd be funny because this is how Mexican people. This is what Mexican people do. I'm like, no. Uh. <laughs> what? And I'm sure Vince sat there. Ha ha! Good crap! Wow! God dang it! All right. Anyway. Good Lord. Vince and Linda McMahon have both spoken in the past about launching a 24-hour wrestling channel, which would make uh, extensive use of the WWF and WCW libraries, and presumably the ECW library as well, depending on their deal with Paul Heyman and whatever becomes of the ECW library. It happens. Yeah. Hashtag stay tuned. I mean, all this news is about the same thing. Uh, there's a bunch of people who are not sticking around, who are sticking around. Uh, I guess Kevin Nash has 10 months remaining on a huge contract that pays him more than $1.6 million per year, and he'd be stupid to accept a buyout for Turner, so Dave doesn't expect him in WWE. When you know who won the pony, there you go. Yeah, I mean, he would debut, though, so what, his, his contract only had a year left? 10 months, yeah. So... I mean, yeah, he, that's about did, right. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, it was February. I, so. I think as soon as it expires, they signed him into a new deal and brought him right in. Uh, Scott Steiner's repeated unprofessional behavior in WCW has soured WWF officials on him, although he was professional and put over Booker Team clean as a sheet on the final Nitro, obviously in an attempt to try to be seen as a team player by WWF, and he got a huge response when Vince said his name on Raw, so he may still get a chance. When he will, it in a year contract? and a half. Oh. Yeah. So and, had a, too. and had a very lackluster feud with Triple H where they repeated a spot from the 1980s with a flex off. That it was, was a pose down, not a flex off. Oh, uh, whatever. It still sucked. Uh, that was but one hey, of the greatest segments in the history of Raw, but I, you know, whatever. Yeah, at least we got to see their vascularity, pal. God dang it. <laughs> Uh, WWF is also not interested in Rey Mysterio, <laughs> uh, which surprised a lot of people when word got out. Uh, several wrestlers approached Vince and went to bat for him. Needless to say, Mysterio is well-liked by everyone and is a star, and Uncle Dave is befuddled why WWF doesn't want him, aside from the fact that he's small. First of all, I laughed the use of befuddled. Uh, second Someone of all... Someone whipped out the thesaurus today. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> Second of all, Mysterio did pop up. Uh, what the f- in, in, the following in July? July? Okay. July O two. Uh, yes. Because I know he was in the opening match of SummerSlam, so that's all I remember. Uh, but that Conan, match sucked. Conan is also on the no interest list, which isn't a surprise. When the Radicals all left last year, Conan was going to jump with them, but WWF wasn't interested uh, then either. Same with Shane Douglas. Who's, who's K-Dog? Good grief. Here's two good ones for you. Sting has a year left on a nearly $2 million per year deal, and much like Nash, he ain't giving that up, so don't expect to see him. Plus, he's 42, hasn't wrestled a full schedule in years, and is said to have somewhat of an ego. Yeah, well... He, he went somewhere else for, you know, a full schedule and probably less money than what WWE would have given him. So, he would go eventually. Yeah. And now some little douche is giving him a trillion dollars to, to you know, play with body bags, and I take that deal, too. <laughs> Good grief. The, and finally, Goldberg. Obviously, there's some uh, serious dream matches with the with uh, him versus either Rock or Austin. But he has two and a half years left on a two million dollar per year deal. Dave thinks is yeah, you would ride it. that out too, <laughs> right? Wouldn't you? Well, yeah. You yeah, did take so. the half year off though, by the way, because he came back before it was over. But. Yeah, two years though, get the bulk of it. Uh, Uncle Dave thinks that if given a monster push and put against WWF's top stars, it still might be worth it for WWF to sign him because they'd make their money back and then some with those dream matches. But the problem is, doing so would upset the WWF salary structure. No one in WWF is making $2 million per year guaranteed, and if they bring Goldberg in with that salary, there's going to be a lot of upset WWF wrestlers. Well, it would have been justified. He was the last guy to take it to WWE, if you think about it. Yeah. Well, they brought him in eventually. He started off hot, petered out after a while, so... Petered know. out. Yeah. What the hell does that mean? Is that not a saying out there? Never heard that in my life. Petered out. He's kind of like, you know, he kind of fizzled out, whatever. I don't know. Sounds how... like the start of a porn movie. <laughs> Peter out. Good, good grief. Now it's the end of a porn movie, Greg. Gosh. Whatever. <laughs> uh, but yeah. So there's that. Hey, he, he had a. Today he's years old when I heard Petered out. <laughs> He had a so-so WWE run, his first run, and then he came back and did some cool stuff. So, there's that. But, all right, uh, off of all of that, here's uh, some interesting stuff. NBC's Dick Ebersol did an interview with the Washington Post and strongly hinted that the XFL would not be returning for a second season, at least not on NBC, despite the network's two-year commitment. Spoiler, hmm. they didn't. So, did, did you watch they a lot would. of... would! Yeah. Did you watch a lot of the original XFL? I went to a few games. Oh, really? Did they? Did you guys have a team out there? Yeah, the San Francisco Demons. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, was the fan experience any good? I don't remember, honestly. Yeah. I, I think, didn't. Yeah. Don't. I didn't know if, like, if you walked in and you're like, "Wow, I've seen more people at a minor league baseball game." <laughs> there were a lot of people wearing wrestling shirts too. So I mean, that was go telling. figure. <laughs> I had a coworker one time. He was like, I'm not much of a football fan, and I definitely don't care about wrestling football, so I'm not going to be watching. And I'm like, it's not wrestling football. He's like, I saw the original. It's wrestling football. I'm like, whatever. Well, oh, dude, that scramble to start the game, man. That's, that was awesome. Yeah. Look, I will say this. Good concept, bad in, uh, in delivery. How yeah. many people... Wasn't there, like, two or three people that got, like, career-ending injuries off of that? I, I think in the opening game scramble when they were getting the ball, the one of the guys got hurt and was out for the whole year, and that was it. There you go. Going forever, bro. <laughs> but Vince McMahon did an interview with the New York Times and kind of uh, hinted at the same thing, saying, quote, if we have no network TV partner, we have no league. And there you go. <sighs> Here you go. Uh, Puerto Rican wrestler Invader One, real name Jose Gonzalez, turned 55 around this time, and Uncle Dave just wants to take a moment to remind everyone that this guy is still a top baby face in, WW- in uh, WWC, 
even though he's a piece of crap who murdered Bruiser Brody and beat the case. Allegedly. All right, allegedly. <laughs> Legally, I think I have to say that. I like how he said, uh, I want to remind everyone he's a big star. Well, no, he's, well he, he was like, keep in mind, this guy's a huge baby face in, in the World Wrestling Council, and yet he is a known murderer, allegedly. So let's think about that for a quick second. <sighs> Good grief. But Scott Hall is also doing stuff in New Japan Pro Wrestling. So throwing that out there, apparently he's getting in better shape. So, yay. Speaking of Scott Hall, his estranged wife, Dana Hall, wrote an apology letter to Scott, which she sent out to various wrestling websites to apologize publicly for the things that she has said about him in the media. Uh, apparently, she uh, said some pretty bad stuff. You don't say. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, back to WCW real quick. I guess Buff Bagwell, or at Nitro, Buff Bagwell and Lex Luger were reportedly still acting like big timers and being cocky, saying that no matter what happens, uh, they're both big time stars and are certain that they'll have jobs after this. Well, Buff did. For a second. <laughs> uh, I, I like how so the person who wrote this put, Q Bad News Barrett. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Disco Inferno did a radio interview and said that he thinks that the news of TNT and TBS canceling WCW and the company being sold to the WWF is all a work by Bischoff. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, man. He still does this crap to this day. It's just a work, bro. I mean, they're, they're working. It. It's just a mark. <sighs> uh. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like the JFK assassination. That was all work, too. He's running the country from a little bunker under the Pentagon. Bro, those were working brains, man. <laughs> uh, all right. Don Callis revealed that he has been in secret talks with Eric Bischoff and has been, ske uh, been scheduled a debut with the new WCW. But then, of course, the deal fell through. Oh. <laughs> what the hell? That was fast. Yeah. yeah well, you, plans change, Greg. An impact call? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, all right, before we get to our last story, I've got to cover this because it's our favorite Muchnik, everybody's favorite Muchnik in wrestling. All oh, right? God. It's Phil of the New York Post. Uh, Vince did an interview on a different radio show, and New York Post, uh, this was, I guess he did an interview with with Howard Stern at the time. And wow, what's seen, going wrong there? <laughs> yeah, I saw clips of it, and... I don't know. It was it was an awkward ass interview, and I was like, "Why is Vince McMahon here?" I I like I know why he's here, the obvious, but like, why is he there? You know, he he just yeah, looks so about sexual positions. Oh my gosh, he just he he looked so out of place and awkward. I don't know. It went okay though, about as okay as a Howard Stern interview can go. What is that saying? I nobody got naked and rode anything. So there's that. Well, why am I watching this? Exactly. But I guess New York Post reporter Phil Mushnick called in while Vince was on the radio show. Because, you know, this can only go well, Greg. Mushnick First of all, I think he hates Howard Stern, too, so... Go figure. Why would they take his call? Well, no, this was not on, on Stern. This was a different radio oh. interview, I guess. Uh, but Mushnick did not come off good. Go figure. Uncle Dave says much Nick made some good points if you were uh, to if you're going to read them on paper line by line. But listening to him, much Nick made things personal and got so pissed at Vince that he came off just as bad as Vince did in the Costas interview. Much Nick's uh, demeanor was totally out of line uh, to the point where he basically buried himself. Vince just sat back and listened. He asked if Vince still used steroids, which Vince, of course, denied. Uh, Vince admitted to using them when he was younger, when they were, quote, legal. And then he and Muchnik bickered over the uh, semantics of what legal means, because technically the ones Vince got from Dr. Zahorian back in those days certainly were not legal. Muchnik also brought up the sexual abuse allegations of the early 90s, which Vince also dismissed, saying no charges were ever brought, and then outright denied that it even happened. Muchnik called BS and said years ago Vince himself had told Muchnik that 
He knew about Mel Phillips' behavior, and he kept him employed after only scolding him to stop molesting ring boys. This, yeah, I'm sure that's something Vince would admit to. Right, yeah, he's like, he would just tell the reporter offhandedly, he's like, well, I knew he was diddling young boys, but, you know, I kept him around. And look, this is off the record. Yeah, as he's walking out, he's like, hey, Phil, off the record, see ya. <laughs> uh, wow. uh, I do not consent, and then he just walks away. Uh, but then they started on about all the usual WWF is too risque com- uh, complaints, and Uncle Dave says that Butchnik seemed to have an obvious vendetta against Vince, which made him look bad. Anyways, all of this leads to Uncle Dave recapping in detail the pedophilia and sexual abuse allegations of the early 90s and the lawsuits, bad publicity, and roles of Terry Garvin, Mel Phillips, and Pat Patterson, uh, Vince's subsequent lawsuits against Mushnick and Geraldo Rivera, who both come for the stories. <sighs> Geraldo. The stash. The stash, yes. Yep. Uh, here's something I didn't know about, by the way. I, I guess I forgot. <laughs> He's uh, still on TV to this day, isn't he? <laughs> oh, yeah, he works for Fox News. So, Fox News. But all right, uh, a couple quick things here, and then we'll get into the show. This one I just thought was interesting. Uh, Undertaker needed 16 staples in his head following a chair shot from Triple H a couple of weeks ago on SmackDown. Wow. Man. Man. He'll get he'll get another one at uh, WrestleMania stitches. I, 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 whoa, uh, getting ahead. I'm just saying. Okay. Yeah. Thank God, man, this is not a good time for him for his head at least. Can you imagine like? I, like, I realized Triple H had been around for a while, and he had some pull at this point. I mean, he was dating the boss's daughter. But it's still The Undertaker. Can you imagine just, like, busting the crap out of him twice in a row? <laughs> He's got to be, like, walking to the back like, damn it. <laughs> in his defense, the sledgehammer thing was nowhere near his fault. That was the prop messed up. So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, but... Final story here, ending on a low note, I guess. Uh, Shawn Michaels was fired just days before WrestleMania. He apparently showed up at a TV taping very high on pills and was passed out backstage. This led to Shawn being sent home and a blow-up argument between Shawn and Triple H, who apparently didn't speak to each other for over a year after this. Something tells me things will work out. Yeah. I had no idea about any of this, by the way. Yeah, it's on Triple H's DVD. He talks about it. Oh, I'd seen that, so I must have just forgot about that part. But uh, but anyway, that's uh, that's basically all I got. I mean, there's other stuff to, to, to cover here, but, I mean, you know, some of it comes after the show and whatever. But, I mean, th- this is a lot of news. So it's all basically about WCW shutting down. So we, we'll, we'll cover stuff on, uh, you know, if we ever cover another show from around this time period but let's uh let's take our next break and when we come back we're going to dive into the event at hand we'll be right back follow the main event marks at facebook.com forward slash main event marks pod on twitter at main event underscore marks and on instagram at main event underscore marks and at main event collector dave's dream car of course he prefers the pearl white to the cherry red but you can't fit three kids and a dog who's prone to car sickness in a sports car. Yeah, Dave's had to compromise a lot lately. But not when it comes to cutting the cord. Fubo gives him all the sport he needs, as well as all the shows his family loves. Don't compromise. Get over 100 channels, plus Showtime and Cloud DVR included. Visit FuboTV.com. The main event marks are available wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. Now back to the show. All right, we are back and about to dive into WrestleMania 17. But before we do, uh, if you're not listening to us on the Unhinged Sports Network, go check us out, unhinged uh, unhingedsn.airtime.pro. Uh, we air every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern and the replay is Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern. So go check us out on So what time there. is that for me? Man, I don't understand those time zone things, I, man. I, I never got it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you mean the sun rises earlier for people? Like, I, I don't get it. All right, anyway. I'm not buying it. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't believe it, Greg. 
But all right. Uh, WrestleMania X7. I, some people get heated about that. They're like, it's not 17, it's X7. That's how they wrote it. Like, I mean, nobody ever calls WrestleMania 16 either. They call it WrestleMania 2000, so. Yeah. I, I, that's what I call it. That's why, I, like, there have been a few times I have to sit and I'm like, wait, which one is WrestleMania 2000? I'm like, okay, 16, got it. But, uh, the date is April 1st, 2001. The tagline is, Houston, we have a problem. And the theme song was My Way by Limp Biscuit, which, this is going to be a, an ongoing thing throughout the whole show. I was so glad because they edit so much off of the network because of licensing. All of the licensed songs are still on the show. So I was very happy about that. Except for Hillbilly Jims. Wait, Hillbilly Jims is different? They use that uh, banjo one. Uh, oh, yeah. They they don't use – they don't have rights to uh, Don't Go Messing With a Country Boy? No. I mean, they didn't even play the Hall of Fame when we were there, remember? Oh, Yeah. That's so weird. Jimmy Hart must have, like, a lock and key on that damn thing. That's like his gold song. <laughs> yeah, I can't let anybody use this. Like, seriously, what kind of price tag is he slapping on that thing where Vince is like, nah. <laughs> like, good lord. <laughs> but the ve- the venue is the Reliant Astrodome in Houston, Texas, and the attendance was 67925 The pay-per-view buy rate was 2.18 which amounted to 1,040,000 buys, which was a record at the time. So, all in all, great attendance, great buy rates, huge show, and it was made even bigger by the fact that they literally killed their competition earlier the same week. I know, you know, you can argue it's been dead for a while, coughing on roller skates, whatever, but, you know, they officially shut it down, I'll say. But we yeah, because it would have some big competition from them, let me tell you. Yeah. Uh, we got an opening package on the life of WrestleMania with an epic voiceover by Freddie Blassie. Look, I will say this. If you take the voiceover off of this promo, it is it has some of the goofiest visuals I've ever seen <laughs> ever with like people in a field carrying a TV and dancing around while they're watching wrestling, apparently. But the voiceover makes it epic. I believe this is the first time you see any remnants of Hogan at WrestleMania. On WWE TV, uh, no. it's like WrestleMania 10, maybe. Nice. Well, there's a nice fact for you. I always loved just, man, it sucked when Blassie passed away for multiple reasons, but we didn't get his epic voiceovers anymore. I think there was... Yeah, this is like one of the best WrestleMania openings ever. I can't remember um, which one it was that they said Vince would li- literally get teary-eyed when, when watching it, that uh, Blassie did a voiceover for. I think it has to be this one. I can't think of anything else he did. There was another one where he's like, you remember where he like walks in and like sits in the stands I somewhere? Think that's and it's like, but I still think this is, this is the one, though. But uh, I was pleasantly surprised. That, oh, never mind. I already I put that later in my notes. All right, pause for it. Uh, first match here. Was Chris Jericho defending the Intercontinental title against William Regal? It went for seven minutes, eight seconds. This feud amounted to Regal was trying to get back at Jericho for pissing in his tea. <laughs> that was working you, piss. Yeah. No, that was shoot piss, Greg. <laughs> if you guys think we're joking, by the way, Go back and look at the build-up package of this. It, it's like, what the hell, man? But in the end, Jericho hit a vertical suplex followed by a lion salt for the win. I was not as blown away by this as I thought I would be. Uncle Dave gave it two stars. I gave it two and a half for average. What say you? I gave it two. It's like they've had far better matches. Yeah. I I was expecting a, just a classic, and I was like, hmm, good opener. Not bad. I mean, it didn't didn't make me go, holy crap, but, you know, it was fine. Uh, up next, we see a black limousine pull into the building, and Shane McMahon gets out and walks in. The camera now goes into APA's office with Farouk, Bradshaw, and Jacqueline all smoking cigars. Bradshaw goes off on some long tangent about the history of, of Houston sports in that arena. And they end up slapping their cards down on the table. And He's like, don't wear a cowboy hat indoors, because his dad said don't wear a cowboy hat indoors. I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> To, we gotta said to, that, like, in, like, a quick two-second whole thing. Like, what the hell did he just say? Yeah, well, the, he must have uh, disappointed his daddy years later when he became JBL. Right? 
Meanwhile, JR is standing there like, uh, that was another thing I laughed at, by the way, was, uh, I, I can't remember. Oh, it was, uh, during the Kurt Angle promo that we'll get into later. <laughs> and Paul Heyman was like, who's stupid enough to wear a freaking cowboy hat? I mean, come on. Like, as an adult. <laughs> nice ponytail, uh, though. Thank yeah. You. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. He had the skull at rocking. Yeah. But, uh, the camera, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we now go to our next match, which is right to censor. Bull Buchanan, the good father, and Val Venus. They have Steven Richards in their corner, taking on the APA, Farouk and Bradshaw, and Taz. Uh, they have Jacqueline in their corner. It's a six-man tag that went just shy of four minutes. You heard that time code right. Uh, the good father missed the hoe train in the corner. He wasn't calling it that at the time, but I don't know what the hell he called it. It was a hoe train. But he missed it in the corner, allowing Bradshaw to hit the clothesline from hell for the win. Uncle Dave gave it a half a star. I gave it a star and a half. What say you? Uh, like I said earlier, I gave it one star. I watched this, I'm like, man, Bobby Cannon sucks. I don't know what it was about that. I will say, I like the APA. I, I like Taz. the finish. I, I like how the other the other team was Bull Buchanan and Supply and Demand. <laughs> yeah, right. And why yeah. did Steve Richards wrestle? I I know. I'm like, did you, you guys literally just signed him to walk around with a sign <laughs> and cut promos. It's gig it's, ever, man. Yeah, it's weird, though. I'm just like, I mean, at least he's not wearing booty shorts and dancing, but whatever. Mm, uh, would have been a sight to behold. He should have dressed like that while he's in right to censor. <laughs> that would have been great. You think about the, the gimmicks of these guys. Define great, please. Well, you think about the gimmicks of these guys before right to censor. You've got Steven Richards, who would, you know, dancing Stevie with the booty shorts and whatever. And then you've got the Godfather, who's a pimp. Val Venus was a porn star. And Bull Buchanan was part of the Truth Commission. I would like, say Bull Buchanan was Big Boss Man's lackey, too. Because he was nobody remembers him. Lackey. Nobody remembers him in the Truth Commission, so. I'm going to say he was Boss Man's, uh, Side, uh, sidekick. See, I'm the reverse. I don't remember him as boss man sidekick, but I do remember him from the Truth Commission. So I don't know. Uh, and then he went on to be B squared, like you said earlier. So he was just like the perennial lackey. But we now go to the back where Trish Stratus wheels in a comatose Linda McMahon through the halls in her wheelchair when Stephanie McMahon stops him to show off her jumpsuit that says Daddy's Girl on the back. Stephanie goes on about how Vince is going to destroy Shane tonight, and then she tells Trish to hand-crush the ice for their victory party later tonight. How does one hand-crush ice? Um, I don't know, just get Mark Henry to do it? Yeah, yeah, that's it. But anyway, we now go to Raven defending his uh, hardcore title in a triple threat. <laughs> In a triple threat match against Kane and The Big Show. I forgot about, when we watched, I watched this back, I forgot this was on the card. And, oh, yeah. Oh, man. I just, yeah. Well, think think about this. Raven, Kane, and Big Show. One of these things is not like the others. <laughs> and I love Raven. So uh, I just, it's an odd three-way, but either way. It went just over nine minutes. Uh, they battle all over the backstage area. Raven nearly cut the power to the entire building when he swerved his golf cart. Yes, he drove a golf cart at one point. He swerved it into a gap that was filled with critical power cords. I guess they said he came from, like, within a half an inch of cutting the power to the entire building and cutting off the, the broadcast completely. Wouldn't that have been great? <laughs> we would have had uh, Beware of Dog uh, all over was, again. What part was that? Uh, when he was driving the golf cart you remember where he swerved and like the wheel fell off like a little ledge yeah that that was they put all the power cords down there to the to the whole building so yeah. they said he if he would have like turned the wheel slightly he would have knocked out the power cords i have a hard time believing that i don't know he's he said that's what he said he got chewed out after the match and like the guys in charge of all that told him they were like you almost like knocked us off the broadcast so, they probably were overdoing a little bit. There's yeah. no way those little wires right there were powering a whole damn, the whole Astrodome. There's no way. Well, they were at least powering the broadcast. I know that. He said they almost knocked him off the broadcast. So 
I, I can believe that because, I mean, that's only like you only need like a couple of chords for that. But either way, um, yeah, so uh, Kane throws Raven through a plate glass window. That was pretty rough. Uh, I wonder if that was working glass or shoot glass. <laughs> the match ends with Big Show. <laughs> Big Show presses Raven up. Uh, they were on the stage. Kane kicks Cho in the face, and both Big Show and Raven fall off the side of the stage through a piece of the stage. And then Kane does an elbow drop off of the side of the stage onto the Big Show. He pins him for the win. I said, this was fun. Uncle Dave only gave it a star and three-fourths. I gave it two and a half stars. What say you? I, overall, I gave it two stars, but as a hardcore match back then, I gave it three. That was really good. Especially for our core standards. Yeah. Well, like I said, it was fun, if nothing else. So I, I didn't sit there and like, man, when is this crap going to be over? So that's a I good was a little, match. I was a little upset that nobody else got involved. Because, you know, the 24-7 thing. Yeah. I mean, but, you know, I mean, that, looking back in hindsight, that might have ruined it. But at the right. time, I was like, oh, no one else is getting involved. That was like a staple of the hardcore matches. Yeah. Well, and it, you could always blame that on, well, they don't want to attack Kane or Big Show, you know, but I I don't know. They uh, wouldn't have to. Raven was the champ. They could pull him aside. Yes. Yeah, Are you telling me no one would, no one was like, could have been sitting there when he went through that plate glass window, pinned him, ran away with the title? I know. <laughs> uh, you're using logic, Greg. Gosh. What was Crash Holly doing on this night? Not being relevant. I don't know. I, I can't think of anything. I, I didn't. I forget what he was doing at this point. Uh, Kane looks like he hurt himself, by the way, because when he gets up for his post-match celebration, he's like kicking and throwing stuff like he's pissed off. Usually that's oh, a sign of, yeah, usually that's a sign of somebody hurt themselves is when you see him like kicking stuff in frustration. But now we go to the back again. Kurt Angle is watching footage of Chris Benoit making him tap out at an earlier date when Edge and Christian run up to him looking goofy as hell. Kurt, Kurt is angry about being made to tap out and says that it doesn't count if the referee doesn't see it and doesn't call for the bell. And so I see Edge, it. Edge and Christian are like, cool, I guess. <laughs> I guess. Uh, but now we get to this one. Odd pairing, but it was fine. Uh, Tess defends the European title. Yes, the European title against Eddie Guerrero, who has a goofy ass looking Perry Saturn in his corner. This went for eight and a half minutes. Saturn interferes quite a bit in this match. <laughs> I just love like, Jim Ross's comment on oh, man. It's like Perry Saturn looks borderline ridiculous. I'm like, what, what, yeah. what is the borderline here? <laughs> right. Well, like, he's like, well, I feel better about my hat after seeing what he's wearing. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yeah, the European title between the Canadian and the Mexican you know, in Texas. That's uh, right. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, proud Europeans right there, man. Making that continent proud. But Saturn interferes quite a bit in this match, and Dean Malenko even comes down to pull ta uh, Test off of a pin. The referee gets distracted by Malenko, while Guerrero blasts Test in the face with the European title for the pinfall win. Uncle Dave gives this two and a four stars. I give it two and a half for average. What say you? I said two. Was, I thought it was fun. It was okay. Yeah. It could have been on the suck. pre show. Yeah. It didn't suck. Uh, it was It was fine. I don't know. But a, up next, a frosted tipped Michael Cole. Now Hell asks, yes. He asks Mick Foley if he'll be an impartial referee tonight. By the way, I just got to point out, during this era, you notice, like, Michael Cole was always just, like, kind of, he seemed like an arrogant smartass during all of his interview segments. Why do you think The Rock and, had so much fun with him? Yeah, and then he carried that to the commentary table. It's like, that's why nobody likes you, Michael. I don't know about in real life. I'm talking about his work. But anyway, uh, Foley leads us to believe that he's on Shane's side, but he will still call it, quote, right down the middle, right here in Houston, Texas. Call it right down the middle, Daddy. I need a whistle. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they do. That. Why didn't they bring in Fonzie for this one, man? It's not like he was working. <laughs> oh, man. But now we go to the next match. Kurt Angle comes to the ring cutting a promo saying that he doesn't really like Texas and that their flag is missing about 49 other stars. <laughs> like, what the hell, man? He then says, quote, lose the cowboy hats, please. You're not seven years old anymore. Oh, that's a nice, 
foreshadowing what's coming in a couple of months. <laughs> I know. I was going to say, you know, uh, in a couple of months, he's going to wear a tiny little cowboy hat four seven years old seven year olds and go i feel like a real cowboy yippee ki <laughs> yippee freaking ki yeah i just oh man this was fun but we get kurt angle versus chris benoit in about 14 minutes uh the referee gets hit at one point and doesn't see angle tap out to the crippler crossface in the end the ref doesn't see angle kick back during a waist lock on benoit low blowing him Benoit then tries to roll Angle up, but Angle reverses it and grabs the tights for the win. Uncle Dave gives us four and a quarter star. I gave it four stars. What say you? I gave it three. It wasn't their best match ever, but damn good. No, yeah, I I have seen better matches between these two, but this one I thought was really good. Uh, definitely WrestleMania worthy, so I dug it. And they let you know later on this feud is far from over, so we'll get into that here in a bit. This is one of my favorite segments on the whole show because it was so damn goofy. Michael Cole is interviewing William Regal as they're walking Sorry, into... Sorry, you just said this is one of my favorite segments, and then you segue to Michael Cole. Just got to point that out. Yeah, it's definitely not because of him. But he's uh, asking William Regal if he feels okay after losing to Jericho. Regal gets annoyed by the question. He walks into his office and sees Kamala, the Ugandan giant, standing on his desk, rubbing a painting of Regal's on his belly. <laughs> Regal shouts at him and he's like get down get down from there <laughs> oh my god oh lord this was this is the beginning of the useless uh, stupid cameos at Wrestlemania yep I laughed my ass off though this was this was good we now get video footage of the WWF doing a pep rally for Wrestlemania at Fort Hood uh, and then Kevin Kelly Hermie Oh, he, interviews, he interviews Kurt Angle, who says that he doesn't have to respect anyone because he proved he's the better man. And then Benoit jumps him from behind, locks in the crossface, and Angle taps like a drunk man before agents pull Benoit off. There ben you bleep. go. Chris Ben Bleep. <laughs> yeah. Look, we're for those of you, I, I get there are people that don't want to do it, have anything to do with Benoit, and you're not wrong. I'm not saying that. But just as a fair warning, we are covering retro shows, and Benoit's on a lot of them. We're not going to skip his segments. Sorry. It just, you can skip ahead, like, 10, 15 seconds, whatever, and you should be good. So, just fair warning. But getting into this next match, speaking of skipping ahead, Ivory defends her WWF women's title against China. Uh, it goes for just over two and a half minutes. Yes, a women's title match at WrestleMania Two and a half minutes. That makes sense of why. Yeah. Man, how far we've come, though, right? <laughs> yeah, but this is the famous China entrance with uh, the pyro cannon. I just got she, that figure. Yeah, and she's very scantily clad. There's this. Had her Playboy already come out at this point? I think so. Yeah, so. Uh, Ivory cries and hugs the women's title before the match. And then when China looks away, she takes it and blasts China in the face with it. Uh, she only gets on offense for about a minute before China dominates her and then wins with a gorilla press drop. I didn't expect the match to end that way, but whatever. Uncle Dave gave it negative one star. I gave it one star. What do you give it? One. I, uh, Man, I sucked. <laughs> I feel like I didn't well, even have like to I ask said, you. I, but... I understood why. This was the only time China ever went for the women's title, I believe. So, well, second, technically. I mean, she did at the Royal Rumble, but... Yeah, okay. Yeah. She's the only time, only person she ever challenged for was Ivory, though, yeah. I, I don't get, like, what was going on here, because, like, I know JR said the whole sticking point with China with their negotiations is she said, I don't want to wrestle women, I only want to wrestle men. And Ross was like, well, it's going to be kind of hard to do. Not all, Not all the guys want to wrestle you. So... Maybe they talked to them. Well, apparently they talked her into it. But now we go into Mr. McMahon's locker room. He's talking strategy with Trish Stratus and Stephanie McMahon while Linda McMahon sits comatose in her wheelchair. Michael, Tol Michael Cole comes in. We we've gotten way too much Michael Cole on the show already. But he, no such he thing. 
He comes in and asks Vince about the, quote, shocking development that Shane bought WCW, and Vince said, you want shocking? I'll give you shocking. And he's man of his word, so there's that. But the pre-match video package of this just reminds me of how gross this whole storyline was and how we could never get away with it in today's times with uh, the whole Vince making Trish bark like a dog thing. And, uh, and then he tells Linda he wants... It started with Vince tells Linda he wants a divorce. And then she goes into like a comatose state. And then they drug her up to keep her comatose while he flaunts his affair with Trish. Shane does not like this, by the way. And... <laughs> I, I, I don't know why. I mean, why wouldn't you like this? But he starts fighting with Vince, and then he buys WCW behind his dad's back. So now we got this. <sighs> yep. But before the match, Shane comes out and he introduces the WCW wrestlers up in the skybox, and he gives a big intro for Mick Foley, who comes out in his spray-painted ref shirt. What a group uh, of WCW, WCW wrestlers that was, by the way. Oh, man, they got the cream of the crop. <laughs> I know. They get, Didn't they have... O'Hare and Palumbo up there. O'Hare, Palumbo, Stasiak, and Gingerak, and I think Stacy Keebler. Yeah. Like, oh, man. That's what the, I think about when I think of WCW. The A Squad. I have a Jax figure of Mark Gingerak, by the way. They're, they're A something. Uh, but all right. Shane McMahon versus Mr. McMahon with Stephanie McMahon in his corner is up next. It is a street fight with referee Mick Foley. This went uh, just over 14 minutes. Uh, Mick Foley was supposed to come out of retirement to wrestle Vince in this match, but I guess he turned it down. Uh, so that's something I did not know. He said he wanted his retirement at the previous WrestleMania to mean something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, until he sees a big money match with, with Edge at WrestleMania, then yeah, whatever, screw my retirement. <laughs> he goes on to become TNA champion for a minute, too. I remember that, yeah. Uh, halfway through this match, Trish Stratus wheels Linda McMahon to the ring before slapping Vince across the face and fighting with Stephanie. Also, or excuse me, after uh, Stephanie slaps Mick Foley, Trish chases Stephanie to the back. Vince takes Mick Foley out with a chair and then rolls Linda into the ring and sits her up in a chair. Uh, when Vince goes to hit Shane with a trash can, Linda stands up to a huge pop, one of the biggest of the night and kicks Vince right in the nards before Mick Foley beats up Vince. Finally, Shane hits the coast-to-coast -coast on Vince with a trash can for the pinfall win. I said this was freaking insane, and I loved all the twists and turns. I'll get into a few more notes here in a bit, but Uncle Dave and I both gave it three stars. What do you give it? Three. I loved it, too. I didn't I see didn't the whole wheelchair thing coming at the end, too, when I first watched it. That was shocking to me. Yeah, this was... Could you believe the freaking pop for Linda McMahon standing up? <laughs> right. Like, holy crap. I, know. Like, I like how the, like, you can see Vince, uh, the, his, the look on his face. Yeah. I like the same uh, look he had when Stacy did that dance. It's like a signature look. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, this is... I, I think this is, like, besides Austin, the biggest pop of the night. Uh, I don't know, because there's one other one coming up that I think was. We'll get to it. Ah, okay. But yeah, this was this is huge. Uh, I guess rumor has it that some of the WCW wrestlers in the crowd were supposed to get involved in this match, but Sean Stasiak blurted out the entire plan to media outlets, so Vince scrapped it. Lance Storm himself claims that Vince was so furious he almost sent them all home. Idiot. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, why would it, hey, we're going to get involved in WrestleMania in, in this angle. I need to tell everybody. What the because frick is wrong is with an idiot. That, how did he not get fired after this? Because yeah. Meat is an idiot. What are you talking about? He, did, he, he got pretty much buried. He ended up talking to the sky and all that. Remember that? Yeah, well, the, the oh. I, I'd seen in the notes that said, well, Sean Stasiak spent the rest of his WWF career literally running into things. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go yeah I don't know I, I like that it's like we're not going to fire him we're going to bury him and then fire him like alright let him go to TNA <laughs> they oh, didn't even yeah. want him joke's on you during a up next during an interview uh, session earlier in the day Kevin Kelly interviews the Hardy Boys about TLC2 they gave a typical babyface promo about the match but now we get into TLC2 
which is one of the three matches of the night for sure. This is the match of the night. Uh, it's Usually. the Dudley Boys defending the World Tag Team titles in a triple threat TLC match against the Hardy Boys and Edge and Christian went just shy of 16 minutes. Uh, Spike Dudley, I, we got to mention, uh, the Dudleys had Spike Dudley in their corner, the hard, not in the match, like, to start off, but, he was like, supposed building to up. Yeah, but starting, uh, or, uh, building up to this, the Dudleys had Spike, the Hardys had Lita, and Edge and Christian had Rhino. Because, you know, that's evenly matched. Uh, but Spike gets involved first, then, uh, Rhino, and then finally Lita. Lita eventually gets 3D'd by the Dudleys. Luckily, she got to take her shirt off first, so there's that. <laughs> Jeff Hardy hits she a floor. She sure gets her ass beat in these matches a lot. I know. But, hey, she's a trooper, man. I'll give her that. Uh, Jeff hits a swanton bomb onto Spike. I've served her copy before. Oh, yeah. Uh, but Jeff hits a swanton onto Spike and Rhino through a table outside, which actually knocked out Spike's front teeth. Did you hear about that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I didn't know that until just recently. And you can see, because I was watching for it, when he lands on him, Spike leans up and he actually, like, puts his hand over his mouth. I mean, he still sold it, so, I mean, damn. I don't know, if I got my front teeth knocked out, um, it would be hard for me to uh, sell anything but the fact that, holy crap, I got my teeth knocked out. <laughs> uh, Rhino finally hoists Christian up, onto the, uh, up the ladder to grab the tag team titles and win the match. So... Two WrestleManias in a row, they uh, pull down the prize. Uncle Dave gave this four and three four stars. I gave it four and a half stars. What do you get it? As a TLC match, I give it five stars. It's nothing short of brilliant. It was very good. I like how they incorporated not just the three teams, which are a lot of bodies to begin with, but then they also incorporate their uh, their corner people very well. They didn't get too involved. Obviously, Rhino played a, a huge part in the finish by helping Christian, who could barely move at this point, helping him up the ladder. It was good. I, I liked it. I enjoyed it. Definitely go out of your way to watch this one, folks. Ah, but we're about to go from the penthouse to the outhouse. But hold on to your uh, britches for that real quick. Uh, we see a video package from WrestleMania Access. Someone spent $205 on a personalized Mr. Sacco with all the money going to Make-A-Wish. So, that's cool. The weirdest part of this whole thing, by the way, was seeing Kane doing an interview as a normal person, wearing his mask, and his hair pulled back to a ponytail. Oh, this like, is like the Whoa. fourth or fifth time at that point I've seen this, so... Oh, really? But up next, we get Mean Gene Oakland and Bobby the Brain Heenan uh, introduced to do commentary for the Gimmick Battle Royal. Mean Gene uh, didn't typically do play-by-play, -play, obviously, but this was the perfect place for him. Him and Bobby were awesome, and uh, I'll get into a little bit of it here in a second. But we are at the Gimmick Battle Royal that only lasted about three minutes. <laughs> Not that I wanted it to go any further, but I was just like, wow. I'm surprised it went that long with all these old guys. Oh my gosh, I know. Half of these guys were like, damn near immobile at this point. But here are the participants. We get the Iron Sheik, Brother Love, Bushwhacker, both Bushwhackers, uh, Jim Cornette, yes, Jim frickin' Cornette, Doink the Clown, Duke the Dumpster Drose, Earthquake, Gobbledygooker, The Goon, Michael P.S. Hayes, Hillbilly Jim, Kamala, Kim Chi, One Man Gang, Repo Man, and Sergeant Slaughter. Oh, and, I'm sorry, and Tugboat and Nikolai Volkov. Rogue's Gallery. <laughs> right. My favorite was, because Bobby kept, like, making insulting comments about everybody as they're coming to the ring. My favorite is they're showing, like, uh, footage of, like, old vignettes for Sergeant Slaughter, where he's, like, shooting machine guns, and he, and Bobby says, now he's only shooting blanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess One Man Gang was supposed to appear as Akeem the African Dream, but he had lost so much weight at this point that he couldn't fit into the costume anymore. Costume? And, uh, you could just put a freaking daishiki on him. That was not a costume. Yeah. Well, I don't understand he, that excuse when they said that. It's like, dude, well, just get a yellow shirt. I know. Well, and now he, like, he uh, does appearances as Hakeem, and all he does is just, he gets super lazy with it. He just puts on, like, a tie-dye shirt. I'm like, so you're Hakeem now? I guess. He's, uh, he's African Dream Dudley. Good lord. 
Uh, but the Iron Sheik ends up winning by last eliminating Hillbilly Jim. I think I forgot to mention. Or no, I did. Anyway, uh, this was just what the f. Uncle Dave gave it a dud. I gave it one star. What say you? I didn't want to give it a star, but yeah, a yeah. star. Well, and then after the match, Sergeant Slaughter goes after Iron Sheik like a real baby face, and he locks him in the Cobra Clutch, and he drops. Then he drops him like passes out, whatever. Oh gosh, the highlight of the whole thing was hearing Mean Gene and Bobby Heenan on commentary. So that was yeah, and seeing their entrance was pretty cool too. Even uh, uh, Bruce Pritchard talked about. He said the Sheik could barely frickin' move at this point. I'm like, well, why do you have him win? I, I think he said he they had him win because he couldn't do the, the bump over the top rope. <laughs> That's... Just rolled him underneath and called that a called it fair. Yeah. Good enough. He, he yeah. I don't know. Uh and Cornette and, and Pritchard both talked about all they did was stand in the corner. They were like, we'll just stand in the corner and beat each other up. And Cornette never wears his glasses in the ring, obviously, so it's hard for him to see. And he said him and Pritchard accidentally kept, like, hitting each other for real and bruising each other up while they were trying to fight for fake. He used a racket on his ass. He did. And he said he accidentally he said he accidentally whacked him for real. <laughs> and then he said he smacked him in the stomach so hard he legit bent over. And when he bent over, he headbutted him in the nose. Good Lord. Sounds like a <laughs> horrible fight on an old person's home. Yeah, he said they just spent the whole time potatoing each other and laughing their asses off. Ah, oh, but now we come to the good stuff here. Triple H comes to the ring with Motorhead playing the game live on stage. The weirdest part of this for me was seeing Lemmy Kilmeister with like clean shaven, because I'm so used to seeing it with the 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 chops and everything. I was like, oh, okay. Must have had a bad weekend. <laughs> uh, but we get Triple H versus the Undertaker. This one went for 18 minutes and 17 seconds. I, I mean, like. Even if I really love a match, um, it takes a lot for me to, like, just mentally be brought back into it and, like, act like this is the first time I'm seeing it and I'm in the moment, whatever. This match did it for me. My blood was pumping before the damn bell even rang, and these two started brawling outside the ring before the bell rang, too. <laughs> Referee Mike, T- Mike Kyoto literally played dead, I'm not joking, for 10 minutes and 10 seconds during this match. Wouldn't so, you two get the hell out of their way? Yeah. My, somebody pointed out they were like, because uh, he gets dropped, and then the Undertaker, like, elbow drops him, and then he's, like, dead for ten minutes after that. And they're like, which leads me to wonder, why was that not Undertaker's finishing move? <laughs> but, well, he is a little hundred-pound ref. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, Triple H and the Undertaker fight up to some scaffolding uh, that, I guess it was for camera equipment, and the Undertaker chokeslams Triple H off of it onto a platform, Undertaker then lifts Triple H up for the... They're back in the ring at this point. Uh, he lifts Triple H up for the last ride. Triple H blasts him in the head with a sledgehammer, busting him open. The the sledgehammer, I, I guess they said that uh, they worked the sledgehammer. Like, it wasn't a real sledgehammer because the, a real one would be too heavy for him to lift up like that. So they said it busted, and that's why he busted the Undertaker open <laughs> because of the material it was made out of. So that's a nice little aside. But in the end, Undertaker did hit the last ride out of the corner. It's one of the biggest last rides I ever saw because he came all the way down with it. And he gets the win. Uncle Dave and I both gave it three and a half stars. What say you? I gave it four. I love this match. It was damn good. Probably their second best WrestleMania match after the Hell in a Cell. Yeah, I know you hold that one in high esteem, which I, not that I don't. It was a great match. Um, I just know that's, isn't that like one of your favorite matches? Hell yeah. Yeah, so this one was damn good, and then he had another barn burner, the ne- uh, Undertaker, that is, had another barn burner the next year with Ric Flair. So this was a good era for Undertaker. All right, before we get into the main event here, we're going to take our la- second-to-last break of the podcast, and when we come back, it's main event time. Follow the main event marks at facebook.com forward slash main event marks pod on Twitter at main event underscore marks and on Instagram at main event underscore marks and at main event collector. Sports fans are gearing up and saving big at fanatics.com, the world's largest collection of officially licensed fan gear from all the leagues, teams, and players you love. 
Unique one-of-a-kind designs exclusively by Fanatics. And autographed collectibles from today's biggest stars ship directly to your home. Join Fanatics Rewards for free to earn fan cash on every purchase. Shop now and for a limited time, get 20% off all orders. Fanatics.com, officially licensed everything. The main event marks are available wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. Now back to the show. We now see The Rock walking down the hall towards gorilla position and Stone Cold glaring at himself in a mirror in his dark dressing room before we get the epic build-up package between the two to My Way by Limp Biscuit. And if this doesn't get you in the mood for this match, then you're dead inside. That's all I'm going to say. But we get The Rock defending the WWF title against Stone Cold Steve Austin. It is now declared no disqualification, which... Jim Ross goes off on commentary. He's like, when did this become no DQ? Who did this? We'll find out. But, Who made you know, that ruling? Yeah. Goes for about 28 minutes. Seeing Stone Cold come out to his Disturbed theme brought a smile to my face. I always loved that one. Uh, I didn't hate it, but I like his original better. Yeah, I'm, I'm torn, but yeah, I just, I don't know. I always loved that Disturbed theme. Uh, the crowd is firmly behind Stone Cold for this one because, you know, he's a hometown boy. Uh, the Rock gets busted open after a monitor shot to the head. Steve Austin gets busted open after that. Uh, both wear a crimson mask. They're both bleeding like nuts. Uh, they recreate the spot where uh, from WrestleMania 13 with uh, The Rock walking in the sharpshooter while Austin's got blood streaming down his face. Mr. McMahon now comes to the ring halfway through the match and pulls The Rock off of a pin attempt. You can see The Rock look at McMahon and mouth, you mother effer, before chasing him around the ring. Later, we can see Austin giving instructions to McMahon to help him. By this time, the crowd totally turns on Austin. They can see what's going on. Finally, Austin beats the absolute hell out of The Rock with a steel chair, and he pins him for the win. Uncle Dave gave this four and a half stars. I gave it an even four. What say you? I gave it an even five. <laughs> I wow. love this match. Yeah. This, this is my favorite what? match between these two at WrestleMania. It always will be. Yeah, I've got to go back and watch their 19 match. Um, just that was great, to too, but this yeah. was just, just so much better, I thought. So much more emotion, so much going into it. What's funny is the WrestleMania 19 match was the only match that they had at WrestleMania that wasn't, like, just a huge brawl through the arena. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but for some reason, Rock had to wear Austin's vest halfway through the match. <laughs> yeah, that was funny. The, yeah, b both were great, but yeah, I, I would probably say this was my favorite. I mean, it was damn good. Uh, well, like, yeah, I, I definitely want to go back and just watch the 19 one to compare, but they had their working boots on for this one, man. After the match, Austin and McMahon shake hands, and then they share beers. Jim Ross is losing his mind and cussing up a storm, shouting, Why, Steve? Why is this way? When the ro when the rock finally it was stands the only up, way. Yeah. When the rock finally stands up, Austin blasts him in the face with the world title, and we end WrestleMania. What a show, man. Uh we're gonna take our final break. When we come back, we are going to get into the final ratings of the show and what is to come in future weeks. Follow the Main Event Marks at Facebook.com forward slash Main Event Marks Pod, on Twitter at Main Event underscore Marks, and on Instagram at Main Event underscore Marks, and at Main Event Collector. It's the very best of professional wrestling's past every Monday on Retro Wrestling Review. I'm your host, Troy, and together we'll hop on my time-traveling wrestling ring and watch along to the greatest matches from yesteryear in the sport of kings. As complex, as controversial, and as brilliant, really, as he is. On Triple R, we'll cover matches from across the world, including American territories, Canada, Mexico, and Japan. Fast action, lots more than that. You'll learn some things, find out about wrestlers and matches you never even knew about, and we'll have some laughs. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Retro Wrestling Pod. Retro Wrestling Review is available wherever you get podcasts, including YouTube, served up fresh every Monday morning. Unbelievable! The crowd! Absolutely stunned! The main event 
Sparks are available wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. Now back to the show. All right, we're back. Final ratings time. Internet Movie Database gives it 9.1 out of 10. Cagematch.net gives it 9.56 out of 10. I just gave it 9 out of 10. What say you? I gave it a solid A-. minus. Yeah, it was... If not for that horrible European title match, it would be better. It had some some ups, some downs. Uh, I was not a fan of the women's title match. Well, that uh, would your, too, yeah. The gimmick battle royal was fun for what it was, I guess. Uh, and yeah, the European title match was all right. Uh, not great. But like you said, probably could have went on the pre-show. But all in all, good show. Uh, my favorite WrestleMania of all time. It's, fa- you know, I, I've got like a top three, and WrestleMania 19 is, is either two or three in there. Uh, but either way, I, it's, and it's only because I hold 10 in such high esteem. It's always been my favorite since I was a little kid. But all right, we are... Done with that one, man. WrestleMania 17, one of the biggest of all time. We're not done with WrestleManias, by the way. In two weeks, we got one more. But next week, we will do ECW Living Dangerously 2000. It is, I'm, I'm really trying to get Jake Grandi on the show. If, uh, if it doesn't work out, Greg said he will jump back on that grenade and he will review the show with me. But we'll see. That is coming up on March 24th. Uh, the bonus show also dropping next Friday will be TNA Destination X 2007. Very much looking forward to that one. Uh, I love the year 2007, probably my best, or my favorite year in TNA history. So, and you and I are both big TNA fans. So looking forward to that one. And then we're going to close out the month, March 31st, with WrestleMania 21. Good stuff. I'm very much looking forward to covering all that with you and or Jacob Grandi. That is the rest of March. One more time before we close out, click on the uh, Fubo TV and Fanatics links in the podcast description. They are our sponsors. You're going to want to check them out. And if you're not listening to us on Unhinged Sports Network, go to unhingedsn.airtime.pro. We are live every Wednesday at 8 and every Thursday at 6. And then we have various replays throughout the week. Uh, check social media for all of that. Thank you for joining me today, Greg. Mm-hmm. And we will see you all next week, later on. <laughs>